so on. And, and, and unless it's something like, uh, I mean, I recently had a case where uh, the employee was drunk, had an accident, didn't drive in, you know, he was only in prison for 10 days, but it's still a judgment. You know, he paid a fine, but it's still a judgment, so you can actually take the conviction. And so in, in those cases, it's quite quick. But, um, you know, like the gentleman has, has, said, has um, correctly pointed out, having policies and procedures are so important because you can rely on them. Um, you know, if you've got a policy, you breach the policy, you give them a warning and say you've breached our internal policy, um, and that can assist you when it comes to an article or to a determination. So it's all about paperwork. Okay, so these are the general guidelines for the service gratuity, which I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with. The, the standard calculation, 21 days for every year of service. After five years, it's 30 days. And um, capped at two years. I haven't seen any of the to two years remuneration yet. And um, prorated to the actual termination date. And um, calculated on the last salary. Um, and it's the last basic salary. It's through the allowances. Um, What's controversial at the moment is where the commission <coughs> and contractual bonuses can be um, taken into account as it was its salary. Um, we have had judgments in the Board of Cassation which have actually said that they should be taken into, uh, into consideration as part of the, the basic salary. We've had judgments which have said it shouldn't be. So it, it all, I, I would say, dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, with commission, where it's regular, and it's, for instance, the employee gets it every month, and um, the employee can say they have a legitimate ex expectation that they're going to get the commission this amount next month, and then they've got a stronger claim um, to say that it's actually part of um, the basic salary. In the DISC, it's been specifically excluded, so there's no gray area there. But under the UAE labor law, contractual bonuses, so not bonuses that they say are discretionary, um, <coughs> you know, sole discretion whether to pay, it has to be a contractual bonus, you receive this bonus every year, this percentage, however it's calculated, is also potentially something that uh, an employee can argue should be taken into consideration. Um, under uh, unlimited contract, if the employee resigns between one and three years, they get one third of the ESG, um, between three and five, they get two thirds, and after five years, you get the full entitlement. Um, and no ESG, which we've discussed, where the employee is terminated for cause under 120. I've just put their guidance in. So, um, ESG is calculated on your basic salary, and the guidance from the Ministry of Labour, I say guidance is a split shift from 60% and basic salary to 40% allowances. That's not in the law, um, but that is the guidance, that is the recommendation. Um, we, do, we do see some companies that put the basic salary at 20%, 80% of allowances, and that's basically to mitigate the liability of in the service maturity if it does become a uh, you know, contentious matter, i.e. Mean, something disputed, and that is actually found upon by the Labour Court and, and can be amended. Um, we have seen instances, I think we had a case of uh, a waiter, I think he was, on a very low basic, every month received um, a, a good commission, so I think basic must have been something like 500 dirhams, for example, but every month received something in the region of 7,000 dirhams. The court um, said the commission should be considered as his basic salary and the end of service opportunity cannot be um, calculated on what was done in the Ministry of Labour contract for 500 Germany. And so that's just an example of some of the topical areas at the moment. Um, the prorata um, calculation, the deduction, doesn't, um, isn't applicable in the DIFC. In the DIFC, um, you know, whatever the calculation is, the employee, the employee gets the full um, end of service opportunity. And this terminated again for, for gross income. Uh, is that something that the companies may choose to forego? They can, they can no, it's, it's 
mandatory, it's under the law. So if you're an employee is on an unlimited contract, um, then there's that reduction. Um, but if the company's doing the termination, then there's no reduction. It's only when the employee... Is, <coughs> yeah, but then uh, what I'm asking is, can they choose not, not to reduce? Can they pay the full cost? Yes, like, anything, anything more beneficial to the employee is not yes, illegal. Yeah. So you you know you can give your um, staff sixty days holiday and we're all quite happy with that <laughs> or six months maternity and we're seeing that some companies are giving it a month. So basically, what, what my guidance is just the bare minimum. But by all means, if you want to give your, your staff more than that, be my guest. The same question which I asked you for the need calculation. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in, in end of service benefit as well. If I'm terminating somebody today yeah. by giving one month notice, should I take that notice period also into, cal into consideration while calculating the number of years? No, um, most um, calculations stop up to your termination. So but what, what did the law say? It says up to your termination. Yeah. So we'll go with that. Mino <coughs> so seems, so seems to be terminating a lot of employees. <laughs> <laughs> So you look at you look at the person's position at the end, 
at the end when they're leaving, what what is the law now? Well, like an employee was working my day and day. So if you see that it, it's going over, which might be in your case, I haven't come across it myself, then you have to do two years. But it, it's there to protect you because those <laughs> Some companies tend to, uh, instead of paying any graduate, to add to their basic salary set and what they said, they calculate. And uh, in case there is a, after the employee team that comes and at the end of the term, he decides to take uh, matters to the court, the calculate. Would he be able to um, recover the difference in case uh, such a thing happens? Mr. Uh, the answer to that is you should, you should not really be able to contract out of any sort of security. So saying I'm going to give you this in, in advance is going to give you problems. We've come across it time and time again. I've come across it particularly in the uh, financial advisors where they get paid on commission. And <coughs> says, um, you're getting paid a proportion of your own service maturity. This will be frowned upon. And you know, the labor law is quite clear. Anything inconsistent with the labor law is null and void. So if you're giving an income basic salary, um, you will have problems. Well, that, that is one of the exceptions. So in the labor law, it does say that you can um, contract out of the end of service maturity. If one, you have a pension scheme, two, you have a savings scheme or retirement scheme. But one, the employee needs to make the election. Two, it needs to be more advantageous. So if we find that the savings scheme is less than the end of service maturity, you will have to top the employer, up, the employee up. If the employee hasn't made the election, there is the risk that they can take two, both. And um, several um, problems that we've come across is um, somebody comes, say, from Australia uh, on secondment. Um, the Australian entity still paying <coughs> the employee. Um, and upon uh, termination or resignation, they're paid the severance in accordance with the Australian law. And you know, the entity here thinks that's sufficient. No, it's not. Um, because one, that's not your employer. That's not the person who sponsors. That's not the entity that sponsors the employee. So the employees here are able to, if you like, double <coughs> if the paperwork is incorrect. So always make sure that the election, and it's a simple for I elect to take this in lieu of, um, and I accept that, and that's fine. Just make sure there's big election. I've seen many situations where there's no election, um, where companies uh, just assume because they've got a pension paid in Denmark, that's going to be sufficient. It's not. In some cases where an uh, employee committed a crime outside the company, mm -hmm. Does that give the right to the employer to terminate him immediately and not to pay him his uh, gratuity or whatever? Yeah, with the reason that uh, such an uh, accident has caused damage to the reputation. I mean, under Article 120 that we just looked at, it spoke about conviction. If there's a conviction of a crime involving a dishonor, you can. But don't terminate before the conviction. <coughs> if you want to terminate because of reputation, this because you, you feel that um, we're going to lose clients, then terminate under Article 107. Terminate with notice. So this is for their dues. So you basically say we're terminating you for a valid work related reason, and then terminate the employee. You, there's no need to always summarize. In this case, some employees they will kiss you. Stop work temporarily so that they, they will suspension. 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 
during this period, mm -hmm. the suspension, which could last maybe a month or so, or a couple of months for investigation to take place, does that mean the employee loses his uh, rights for this period? You, you need to pay, I think, the maximum off the top of my head of 10 days for suspension. <coughs> So it can't it can't go on indefinitely. Then then you need to pay the employee. Then you need to pay the employee whilst conducting the investigation. If you feel that you've got enough grounds to terminate, then terminate. But terminate with notice if there's no conviction. That's always my advice. Terminate with notice. You've got a valid work related reason, so terminate. Is it legal to reduce the num loss of pay days while calculating the number of years for graduate? Yes, you're, you're allowed to do that. Um, so the labor law says um, unpaid days. So for example, the, the lady who was off for the 100 days unpaid, if you wanted to stick to the law, you could potentially reduce that. And I know that we've had an example of when um, an employee was on the 45 days sick and then the company reduced um, the in the service gratuity to the last date that they were paid. That was legal. Okay. Um, okay, so repatriation um, is another question for one of the um, Following termination in the event of no new. Yes, back. Is there a redundancy clause now in the labor law? If you make a employee redundant, you have to compensate them for three months? There is no redundancy, either in the DIFC or in the employee. No redundancy. So strictly speaking, redundancy is not recognized. Okay. But what we saw, especially when the bubble was during the economic crisis, is that the courts were not <coughs> awarding arbitrary termination in all cases. They were taking the, the company's circumstances into account. So if you're going to make um, an employee redundant, let's say for financial reasons, if it does go to court, the court will most likely appoint an expert to you know, have that investigation um, as to whether it's a genuine redundancy, work-related reason. If it is, then that's fine. But strictly speaking, the employee is able to claim arbitrary termination, which is three months compensation. So if the companies are not really even on an unlimited, it doesn't matter. Unlimited. If you're use, if you're using the, the reason for redundancy, that isn't a work-related reason. So um, I, I think I said previously, on an unlimited contract, you can terminate it under 117 for a valid work-related reason. Redundancy is not classed as a work-related reason. What is work related? Capability issues, poor performance, and anything like that. And um, conduct, that's work related. Uh, redundancy isn't. Um, so potentially the employee is able to claim um, compensation. So nothing more than three months. Nothing more than three months. And a lot of companies know that. So you know, you offer two months um, for payments, employees are like employees are likely to accept. Um, and then, you know, perhaps some waiver wording that you take as we call it an effect to our share payment, additional liability, um, and then you agree that you I have one more question to Article 120. If somebody is convicted of a crime, not in the UAE, but somewhere else in the world, does this also count as a reason to enter contract? I suppose if at the time of um, recruitment you were unaware um, and you became aware, then no, no, not uh, not a crime that was before the recruitment. Maybe during the time the contract is oh, actually okay. valid, and the person was on, on annual leave somewhere else and was convicted, of, and then did a crime in a different country and was convicted of it, came back. So here there was no police case, but you will be aware of this conviction. Is yeah, it I then also if possible? You have a conviction, you going to request, <coughs> I mean it's a very rich uh, evening with questions uh, and we were expecting that with the subject, but may I, may I request that we uh, can just hold the question, I appreciate it's a very relevant for each subject, but for, so for those of you who may, may have to leave um, soon, and 
least we can complete the, the, uh, the evening presentation and then just invite you to, to ask some questions Chat, after that. Yeah. We uh, may just bear with us for that. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so uh, repatriation, we are coming to the end. Uh, repatriation, um, single one way economy class um, ticket back to your home country. Um, what's been agreed in the contract is really looking at um, shipping costs. Um, a common question is do we have to pay for shipping costs? Um, no, unless it was contractually agreed. Normally, what you agree coming in, potentially, you should be going out. So make sure the employment contract is quite clear. If you're only paying for shipping costs coming in, then say that in the contract. You know, it will only be a one-off um, relocation package or whatever. So that it's quite clear. <coughs> so it's quite important that um, the employment contracts are, are um, written um, quite clearly. GIFC as well. Um, it, the law itself doesn't set out repatriation, but the obligation is there because of what's called the personal secondment um, agreements that the company um, signed with the GIFC or the three firms in TCOM. Okay, um, post termination and restrictions um, are basically non compete clauses that I'm sure a lot of you probably have in your contracts. Um, you can't get an employee unless they're 21 to sign it. They really need to be specific. So for non compete, it needs to be um, quite narrow and um, tailored to the activities of the business um, and a geographical scope. So if you want to restrict someone, don't put a verb or um, they're never allowed to work ever again. Put JASPA, put TCOM, or think about where your clients are. Really make it um, quite narrow. The narrower, the more easy to um, enforce, the wider, the more difficult to enforce. Um, I personally would always say 12 months, and that seems to be the preference by the court. Anything over and above that can be seen to be onerously restrictive. And um, some employers have put what's called a limited damages clause instead, which basically says, if we find that you breach our contract, we'll pay us three months salary. Don't put in millions, but this is something that's really if most of your clients are in TCOM, then why, why put, or well, firstly, if I'm saying why put UAE? You know, UAE is Iraq, it's Jera, you know, be reasonable, um, because that's what the court will look at um, for impossibility, and that's the same general principle elsewhere, even in the GIFC, that uses common law and principles. It's all about reasonableness um, and not just being relationally. Ever work again after they leave the organisation? Okay, so we'll just look quickly at the ministerial <coughs> updates and then we'll call it a day. So, um, I mean, it'll still be interesting to see how they will work in practice. Um, we're following this with interest as lawyers. So we have the first one, seven six four, which um, is uh, looking at the offer. So basically, an entry permit for an employer will not be granted unless an employment offer has been filed with the Ministry of Labour. So the offer is before the, the employment contract. Many times you hear someone was in India or was in the UK and they received an offer. They got on the plane when they got their Ministry of Labour contract. The salaries would be different, the compensation, the housing allowance is gone, and um, the individual has sold their house and they've got no alternative but to, but to sign the offer. So this is basically telling organizations that whatever you offer the employee, you have to stick to that. You cannot then change it between offer stage and um, visa stage. Um, and I think that's actually quite a positive um, move in the right direction because um, we have come across um, many situations where once the employee lands in Dubai, the terms and conditions are, are amended. So we think the offer will be most likely similar to the MOL um, employment contract, which should have the, um, the salary, the compensation, uh, the, the benefits, the allowances. Um, you're not allowed to change it unless, of course, the terms will be more generous, which is great. Um, we still anticipate that you'll still be able to have a company offer, but as long as it's consistent with the law. Um, so that's basically in a nutshell.
until the first um, decree. So these will all be effective first of the year next year. The second one is um, 765, and it, it actually looks at the limited contract uh, and termination. So before I mentioned that it was four years, now it's been reduced to two years. And basically what they're trying to do is to allow expat and workers to be more flexible and um, before it was very rigid, there were bans, you needed NOC, and, and that's interesting. So basically they're giving employees a lot more freedom to work. Um, uh, if there's a limited contract, um, you're actually, um, under this new decree, able to, if you like, get out of it. Um, so you need to notify the other party, obviously honour any contractual obligation. So you can say, well, I, I'm going to leave in a month then you need to honour your contractual obligations. But then it still asks for a, 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 it still asks for one party, a breaching party, to indemnify the other party, which is really similar to the, the current position where we spoke about the three months or whatever the length of the short term point of the 45 days. I, uh, when we looked at this, um, we felt that there was, there, was a potential, there was a potential conflict with the labour law, simply because the labour law says that the employee's compensation is 45 days. The decree says whatever you agree between one and three months. So um, if you agree three months, that is potentially in conflict with the law. So we'll have to keep our eye on that and see um, whether there'll be amendments or what the gui guidance is from the Ministry of Labour. And of course you can terminate a limited um, uh, unlimited contracts, uh, how do you terminate under the new decree? Not very, uh, very different, but you can uh, uh, terminate it by mutual consent, give notice, but the notice cannot be over three months, so that is a major change before you could go, the notice could be six months. Uh, now they're really trying to restrict um, the notice. So the notice, the maximum is three months, so that's quite important for, for um, you to take away. Uh, again, in the notice period, parties are supposed to honour their notice. If you don't honour your notice, then there's compensation. So if you leave um, before, or if um, the employer terminates before, then there's compensation in your notice. Similar to the current position, Article 120, of course, you can terminate. But it does really stress that all parties should follow legal procedures in due process. So that takes us back to disciplinary procedures. Um, you know, valid termination, uh, not just uh, some arbitrary termination. All those, um, you know, mechanisms in the labour law um, are still there and should still be followed. Um, the last decree um, seems to be focusing on um, visas, um, visas and, and, and banks, basically. Basically, what they're saying is that new visas will be granted to an employee under a limited contract who has worked the limited period and the, um, the employment contract has not been renewed. Um, mutual consent, so you can both agree to, to part ways, but provided six months service has been um, served, so it should have had, the, the contract should have at least run for six months. Six months of service, however, is not required for employees with um, high school certificate or above. I think they face um, categories one, two, and three. So um, service is not required. So that effectively means if you have a